Welcome all, thank you for coming here. So this is the 14th Charlemagne Distinguished Lecture. It's a, it is an honor for all ACES doctoral fellows to be able to continue this series of talks. The CDLS give us the opportunity to invite the most prominent researchers in the many fields that ACES is involved. And some of these names have been Professor Jan LeCun, Director of AI in Facebook, Professor Tinsley Oden, Founding Director of the Institute of, for Computational Engineering Science at the University of Texas, or our, our most recent guest, Professor Marquat, Chairman, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Foxhund Centrum Unit. Today, I'm happy to include in this list as the 14th distinguished speaker, Professor Daniel Kerman. So before I start to introduce our next speaker, I would like to extend a warm, a warm welcome to Professor Klee, as representation of the air of the hub, who will say some words. Ladies and gentlemen, dear Professor Kramer, Sarah, and colleagues. Also from behalf of our rectorate, I want to welcome you very, very heartily. And I think it's a very good measure that ACES, our credit school, it's a credit, and you know it's our interdisciplinary credit school of advanced studies in computational engineering science, that the young students, the postdocs, I think postdocs or PhD students, organize these special lectures, this Charles Manuel Distinguished Lecture. And in this case, I think it's a good thing that you invite such famous persons because I think you can learn a lot of them. And I think it's a very good thing. ACES, you know, it's a credit school, and credit schools are very important for us, for our university. And ACES is also a part of uh, one of our next excellence cluster proposal. And uh, we are a university, we are working interdisciplinary. And this is a special, very good example that it works. And therefore, I think you will hear, hope, I hope that you will hear today very interesting things and you have very good discussions. And therefore, I want to thank you again that you come from Munich in this weather. I've heard in Munich there's snow here. Very, it's raining, it's very often in Aachen. But uh, thank you very much and I hope that you will have very good discussions. Thank you, Professor Glenn. Next, I would like to introduce Professor uh, David Bomes. Uh, professor Bomes is the Professor of Mesh Regeneration and Optimization at the LFDH and has been junior professor in ACES since 2014. Please, Professor Bomes. So, hello, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you on behalf of the ACES Graduate School to today's Charlemagne uh, lecture. Every semester we all look forward to this very special day where a distinguished speaker is invited by the doctoral fellows of our graduate school. And I should mention here that our uh, fellows, they are very selective in their choices, so only the best of the best get invited. So, this means that in uh, recent years we had the opportunity to get inspired by many extremely bright minds. Daniel Kremers fits perfectly into this elite group and we are very happy that you found the time to come today. Um, his research area is computer vision, which roughly speaking means that uh, tackling the problem of teaching computers how to perceive and understand the environment. And his outstanding scientific contributions are not only deep theoretical foundations, but moreover, they strongly impact our uh, daily life. So for example, through self-driving cars. Um, well, it is not Christmas yet, but having Daniel Kremers here feels like an early present, and I'm very much looking forward to the talk. Um, this is all from my side, so with this I hand over to Miguel, who will further introduce the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, so now I will go on with, with a bit of history about our speaker today, which is quite extensive, despite I believe he's the youngest guest that we have host here. Also, Professor Kremers started his career during the 90s at the University of Heidelberg in mathematics and physics, graduating with honors. 
He continued doing his PhD at the University of Mannheim, where he started to get interested in the field of computer vision. In 2002, after obtaining his PhD, he went to the US, where he spent the next two years at the University of California and one year in Princeton, until he came back in 2005 as professor, first in Bonn and now since 2009 at the TU Munich, where in the meantime he has consolidated an institute of over 20 researchers. In addition to his research, he also finds time to be associate editor of two of the highest impact journals in computer vision, as well as chair of the of the main computer vision conference, European Conference on Computer Vision, the CDPR, or Asian Conference on Computer Vision. With hundreds of articles, conference papers, and book contributions, and plenty of awards, such as the prestigious Leibniz Prize from the German Research Foundation in 2016, or the Google Faculty Research Award, as well as many best paper awards, his contributions to the field of computer vision have been many and ever more impressive. His main focus has been on reconstructing the world from usual uh, digital images, which any camera can take, in contrast to more common, commonly used point cloud methods based on laser scanners. Professor Kremers has dealt with both the mathematical development of methods, such as variational methods and the convex, formula convex formulation of cost functions, but he also has done quite a spectacular application of those methods. His first impressive breakthroughs were in the field of segmentation. By combining prior data about the objects to be segmented, he was capable to improve remarkably the detection of silhouettes, but this was only the beginning. The next step in his career involved to add time series theory to predict movement, and therefore detecting objects not only in static images, but as a continuous flow leading impressive practical results. And in recent years, his focus has moved more towards the 3D reconstruction, from either multiple cameras or a single moving camera, what has had quite big, big impact since, as you can imagine, 3D reconstruction plays a crucial role in many new technologies such as self-driving car or drones. And finally, probably the most impressive yet, the combination of all the previous technologies to be able to reconstruct actions in 3D. But enough for my talk. Uh, let's Professor Kremers himself to impress us with his research. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Daniel Kremers. Thank you, Miguel, for this wonderful introduction, and I'd like to thank the whole team of AITSIS for organizing this. It's quite for me and an honor to be here tonight. After so many famous speakers, I hope I will not thank you. <clears throat> and I should pass on a lot of this honor to the people who actually did this work. This is something that we as professors know. We always stand in the limelight. We take all the credit for the work that was actually done by someone else. And in this case, <clears throat> it is Predominantly, these three former students of mine, they have all moved on since their PhDs, um, but they have done a lot of the work that I will be presenting. Before I get into the work, let me start with a quick advertisement. As always, uh, also in television, there's always ad breaks. Here comes the first ad break, hopefully only one. Um, Next year, we're organizing ECCV, the European Conference on Computer Vision, one of the three largest conferences in computer vision, and it's gonna be happening in a little less than a year from now in Munich. I'm not sure I'm looking forward to it, because it's a heck of a lot of work to organize. We're expecting around 3,000 people there, but if you have not been to Munich, this might be your occasion to visit Munich. It's a week before the Oktoberfest, by the way. So this is ECCV. <clears throat> now, again, as I said, to thank the people in my team who have been uh, doing uh, amazing research and I've been very proud to work with all of these. It's a fairly large team. We're about 25 PhD students. Uh, we have about 25 PhD students now and about five postdoctoral researchers. Jörg has actually joined us recently from Aachen. You might have met him here uh, in the last year or two. <clears throat> We're always looking for talents, so if you don't know what to do next in the coming years uh, as a postdoc, as a PhD student, or if you know people who are looking for interesting research to pursue in their careers, please uh, let them know about us, that they can get in touch with me and we can talk about possibilities. <coughs> 
With this kind of lab, invariably we work on a lot of topics, on lots of different topics also, and it's a bit difficult to summarize that in, on say, a slide or so, but there's work on autonomous robots, in particular flying robots, for example, there's work on uh, um, methods, convex optimization, variational methods, machine learning, deep learning, image analysis, video analysis, and then 3D shape analysis is another topic we work on, on the topic I'll talk about today, construction. But to give you a few glimpses into research, in, in the context of autonomous drones, we've been developing systems that uh, use sensory data, in particular cameras, to fly autonomously. We've seen drones in the public, but most drones that you would are remote controlled by some human. Here it's not. These systems are flown by a machine. There is no human pilot. And so these systems use sensory data to localize themselves and to reconstruct their world. And so we use these systems as a test bed for real-time computer vision. Then I mentioned 3D shape analysis. Why interesting? Well, in this talk I'll talk a lot about reconstructing our 3D world from cameras. But once you have reconstructed you know, shapes like this human figure, you might want to try to interpret that shape. You might want to know which points on this shape are corresponding to which points on the other shape. And so here we can identify some point and associate it with similar points on very deformed versions of that shape. And so this gets us to an understanding of what is the shape that we have in front of us. <clears throat> but again, today I'll talk about 3D reconstruction because this is probably one of the topics that we've worked on most and it's definitely one of those topics that is most interesting for the larger audience. 3D reconstruction is a topic that you're all familiar with from everyday life. You walk around this world and with your eyes you see that world, but what you see are always two-dimensional projections of the underlying 3D world. And the challenge is, given a set of projections, images taken either with your eyes or, in our case, with a camera, can we reconstruct the 3D world behind it? <coughs> and the question is, at that point, uh, from all conceivable reconstructions, are we able to compute the best possible one? This is really the goal. And the first question that one has to look into, and I want to highlight this a little bit, why is this a challenge? There are many ways to, to phrase this. If you come from applied math, you would say what we're solving here is a problem of infinite dimensional optimization. That sounds, throws a lot of people off, but let me make that very intuitive. Why infinite dimensional? If you start with a wild guess at what's in front of the camera, say a sphere, you can then start perturbing that sphere at all its points in the normal direction and what you get is new geometric configurations. And in some sense, each point on the sphere is a separate degree of freedom for the optimization. And since there are infinitely many points on the sphere, there is your infinitely many degrees of freedom. So it's not very profound. But what it really means is that the space of conceivable reconstructions is very large. For people from computer would actually see that slightly differently. They would chop up the world into lots of little pieces, so-called voxel, vol voxels, and then you can say on that discrete grid, computer scientists in my experience like to think about the world as a discrete uh, world. There's a lot of arguments whether it is or not, but let's take that standpoint. We discretize the world and for each little volume one of these, you ask, is this object or is it background? So for one volume element, you only have two choices, object or background. Now if we look at two volume elements at the same time, each can be object, so that's one possibility, each can be background, that's another one, or one is object, one is background, or vice versa. In the end, you have for these two voxels four possible combinations of reconstructions. And you can imagine with every additional voxel that you consider, the number of possible reconstructions doubles. And so with three voxels, we'll have eight possible reconstructions on that three voxels. And if we take, in this case, typically we take n voxels, then the number of possible 3D reconstructions on that grid is 2 to the power of n. 
Now in practice, n is typically, like for this little reconstruction for Beethoven, it's 512 cube. That's not a very high resolution of volume, enough for Beethoven, but let's say not enough to reconstruct this whole town of Aachen. So it's a fairly small volume, but still we can ask how many reconstructions on that grade. And uh, you know, I have a daughter now, she goes to school, so she actually has a calculator, and so I borrowed her calculator, and um, so I punched that in because I wanted to. I gave a talk in the, in the German Museum, an evening talk, a little bit like here, and so I thought for the public, I'm actually going to, for computer scientists, you know, it's enough to know this grows exponentially. At that point, they say that's fine for me to know, it means it's big, big, but the public wants to know how big, so I said, I'll calculate it. And so I punch it in the calculator, you should try that at some point. It does not work. I was really disappointed, you know, I have not used the calculator since what, high school maybe, right? And there I use one and it's not working, right? For one side, I want to use it. So I had to do this in my head. Turns out it's difficult to do. And what comes out is roughly 10 to the 40 million. So that's the number of 3D reconstructions on this little lattice here. It's a one with 40 million zeros. So many possible reconstructions. And you can imagine there is no way to try all of them. You cannot try each project it into the images and see which one matches best your observations. You just don't have enough time to do that. And still, we would like to get the best among all of these reconstructions, in some sense. And the question is, how can we phrase it to really get the provably best reconstruction? This is one of the key challenges that here. So there'll be six parts in my talk, and in the first I will talk about how can we address this, how can we get provably optimal reconstructions efficiently. Efficiently means in a way that we don't have to try all of them individually. And then I'll talk about 4D reconstruction. This is reconstruction of actions over time. I'll talk about real-time capable reconstruction methods. And in the second part, I will focus on uh, an additional challenge. In the second part, I will assume that we do not know where the cameras were placed. So we have to reconstruct and estimate the location of the camera as well. For the first part, I'll assume we know the location. For the second part, I'll assume the location. Say if you put the camera into a car and you drive around, then you will not know exactly where is the camera at any given time, or where's my car. This is one of the things that you want to compute. So, but for now, as I said, we'll start with known camera locations, and then the question is, how can I reconstruct from images? How can I tackle this problem of reconstructing a 3D shape from images? this infinite dimensional optimization problem. And it turns out there's actually very many ways to get 3D from images. And one of the most powerful techniques is that of so-called photoconsistency. So it's actually quite simple. If you have and you know where the cameras are located, how they are facing the world, if in addition someone magically tells you which point here corresponds to which point there, say this nose corresponds to that nose, then all you need to do is triangle rays and you get the 3D location of the nose. And you can do that for all the points. The key challenge is you don't know the correspondence, you don't have it. And there is no oracle that's going to give you the perfect correspondence. And the algorithms, vision people know that to compute correspondence across images, which points here correspond to which points there, it's one of the nastiest problems computer vision. If you can avoid it, you should avoid it. And there is a way to avoid it, interestingly, and that is to tackle the problem from the opposite vantage point. We are going to go into that 3D space and just say for any point in that 3D space, any voxel, if you will, is that point on the object surface, yes or no? If it is on the surface, once I project into pairs of images, I should be seeing the same color here. This is making some assumptions about the object being so-called Lambertian, etc., meaning the color doesn't change with the viewpoint, meaning it's not shiny or specular, but it's actually a valid assumption for most of our world. Whereas if I then look at a voxel like the red one that's not on the object surface, upon projection into pairs of images, I see different colors. Why? Because cameras are not actually looking at the same structure. 
and with this color consistency, I can differentiate green and red points, points that are on the surface from points that are not on the surface. And more specifically, I can do that for all points in that 3D volume. Let's call this 3D volume R3. This is our 3D volume. Then we can associate with each point in that 3D volume some value of what's called a photoconsistency. And by definition, we will assign small values near zero if the colors match. Say for the green point, it will have a small value of rho and large values near one for points like the red one that have bad color consistency. And we can compute that photo for each point in 3D space. And then we can go ahead and say, find a surface S in that 3D space, such that the photo consistency integrated over the surface is as small as possible. Way we have phrased reconstruction of 3D shape in two lines as a problem of optimization. We have a cost function. And now we say, now find a surface S which minimizes this cost. So that's nice and easy, two lines of calculation. To write it down, the difficulty is this cost function is not convex. So for a mathematician, that means, is, uh, he can tell you that means it's bad. That means if you take the space of all surfaces, there is no way to efficiently find the best one at least a priori. It's not clear how you compute the best surface. What we managed to show in 2009, I'm skipping a lot of the details here, but we showed the, that for this and similar types of cost functions, you can actually compute provable reconstructions by a technique that is called convex relaxation. And that means you rephrase the same optimization problem by an equivalent one, so here you start with some cost that is not convex and you replace it by a convex one in a way that the minimizer of this one is the same as the minimizer of that one. And for this class of cost functions, it turns out this can be done. And once you have a convex reformulation, then you can basically start with a random initial surface and once you minimize the energy, you get the minimum one efficiently without trying all this is just a 2D schematic visualization. In two dimensions, you can search for the best one. You just discretize your space and try all solutions. But as I mentioned, once you have an infinite dimensional problem, you cannot try 10 to the 40 million uh, solutions. It doesn't work. In our case, it means we can take a set of images, we can compute the photo consistency. Typically, we take about 20 or 30 images from different vantage points. And then we construct this photo consistency. We set up our convex formulation. And this is what you see here. By minimizing this energy, the algorithm carves out the optimal reconstruction. I say optimal. It doesn't mean it's the best reconstruction you can get from these images. <clears throat> but it is the best with respect to the cost function we set up. This is the provably optimizing surface. <clears throat> In fact, <coughs> to get optimal reconstructions, there may be, uh, or more accurate reconstructions, you could revert to later. I'll come back to what the advantages of camera-based techniques are. We did a where we showed that also silhouette consistency can be uh, imposed in this framework as a convex constraint. And as a result, we get very accurate reconstructions uh, that are very, that even have a lot of fine scale details. Not quite what you could get with a laser scanner, but not far, let's say. I'm going to skip some of these slides. It explains a little bit how to get things convex, but uh, I think for time reasons, I'll just skip this. If anyone is interested in the details, I'm giving a talk in the math department tomorrow, which provides a lot of detail about convex optimization, uh, more than I can have here. And also about algorithms to minimize convex problems. This is an algorithm, a so-called primal dual algorithm, but for time reasons I think I will rather skip the details here. What can you do with cameras that you could never do with a laser scanner? 
you can reconstruct actions over time. We can film an action such as this one with 16 synchronized cameras and then we can reconstruct the action time step by time step. With a laser you can't do it because you have to scan line by line etc. So you cannot resolve an action at an instance of time like you can do with cameras. In addition with the cameras you get the colors so you can superimpose the colors and all of a sudden you get that action as if you were watching it except there was this where we're looking at now. And so this is often called free viewpoint television. In my view, one of the possible futures of television that a few years from now, when we watch our favorite movie at home, we can actually, while the movie is running, while the action is playing, we can change the viewpoint and kind of go in and out of the scene and decide from which vantage point we want to follow some action. Because this is what you see here is real-time screen capture of my student Martin Oswald while the action is playing. He's showing, uh, he's panning around with a mouse in the scene. As a professor in vision, it's my job to basically travel around the world, attend conferences and get an understanding of where is the state of the art, what is doable, what can we do with computer vision techniques, what can be reached and to have some expectations because once the next student starts I have to put them on topics where I think this is a topic that is still open but I believe can be solved. And usually I have fairly good understanding and expectations what can and cannot be done. But sometimes I must admit I'm wrong. Here's an example. Results are results that Martin Oswald obtained with his methods. And what you see is we can, just with cameras, reconstruct actions over time at a level of precision where the entire rope of the rope jumping girl is reconstructed. And I must admit, when I saw these results, I could not believe my eyes. I did not think this was possible to actually get that level of precision. Because you can hardly see the rope with your eyes in these images yourself. And so this is where we stand today with computer vision techniques. We can resolve the 3D world around us in time at a very high level of precision and detail. One of the things I didn't say though is that it took a long time to compute instructions. So for example, this one was 2008. It took us about an hour to compute. Is it with a museum in Bonn? We walked around, took pictures, and reconstructed these statues. Uh, the rope jumping girl took three minutes. It was a few years later, with better algorithms, faster compute power, and GPUs, it took us three minutes to reconstruct the girl. But if you want to deploy these techniques in uh, technologies like self-driving cars, this is pointless. If I reconstruct the girl in front of the driving car, and it takes three minutes, by the time the machine says, yes, there is a rope jumping girl, there is no more rope jumping girl at that point, right? So it kind of defeats the purpose. So the question is, can we do dense reconstruction of the 3D world in real time? There had been reconstructions, in, but the challenge is, can you do that from a handheld camera in real time? This is what we set out to do. This is a work we did in 2010. The idea is quite simple. Here we have a camera observing that world. And then that I mentioned before, we assume that some given point here in image one has the same color as in the other image, this kind of color or brightness consistency, if you will. And here you can see that point, let's give it the coordinate x. Once I have x in so-called homogeneous coordinates, it, there is a 3D location which is u times x. u is the unknown distance from the camera. This is what I don't know u, but there is some u. u times x is this point. Then I rotate and translate into the new cameras. This is the rigid body motion uh, between these cameras. And then I do a perspective back projection into image II here, and these two should have the same color. This they will never have exactly the same color, so I set up a cost function, which at a first glance looks a little bit complicated, but not for people who are like 
Benjamin Berkels. He's worked on variational methods for years. He will look at this in one second, we'll see what it is. It's exactly this color consistency put into a cost term, which basically penalizes deviations from that color similarity. And then there is a second term, which is called the regular rise, weighted here by some parameter lambda. And this basically says that from one point to the next, the depths u should not change too much. This is some assumption that we put in and it that mimics something like a soap film. So we want a dense reconstruction and we say neighboring points should have similar depths. And that's characteristic of soap film, minimal surface kind of configuration. And you will see the effect of this thing. It creates a geometric fill-in. Whenever I don't have any color information, say on white walls, etc., this kicks in and creates a soap film-like filling. So you can minimize this and it turns out you can do that in real time. Here's the camera footage of this handheld camera. On a little bit, just one gray value camera. These are the reconstructions. Initially they're very blurry but with more images streaming in, in this online fairly stable reconstruction. And here you see that geometric fill-in, this soap film-like fill-in, because we the sides of this flower pot and so the algorithm doesn't know what the shape there with this soap film like this thing. If you want that or not is a different question but this is uh, this is a dense reconstruction that you get and you can get it in real time we did quantitative evaluation so that you can run it at up to 40 frames per second. And at that point, I must say, we were a bit ahead of our time. The vision community is growing very fast. There's lots of people all over the world working on quite similar topics. And if you have a, a topic that you're working on, there's two cases. Either it's not of interest, or if it is of interest, then you know there's at least 10, 20 parties working on the exact same problem at the exact same time. And we know how that is, and then it's not easy to be faster than the competition. And it happens a lot to my students that they come up with a solution and by the time they have the solution there is a paper out by the competing group in Zurich or wherever and they have done it before. This is part of our, our life that we are sometimes behind but in this case we were first, this is 2010 and then for example in 2000 there was an DTAM that is very similar by the Richard Newcomb and Andy Davison's lab in London. 2012 was the lab around Horst Bischoff in Graz, and 2014 was Zurich. And so we were a bit ahead of the competition. But all these are very similar in, in spirit, real-time dense reconstruction. What I didn't talk about yet is how do you estimate the camera motion. You saw in the flower pot I had this variable G that models the camera motion, translation and rotation. I assume it's known. In practice, when you move a camera around, you don't know the motion. And chicken and egg problem, which used to be called structure from motion, or structure and motion. And more recently, people have moved to calling it visual SLAM, where SLAM stands for simultaneous localization and mapping. Mapping means you want to create a 3D map of the world. Localization means you want to localize your camera, your robot, your self-driving car, whatever. This is a problem that's been, become really popular in the last few years, but it's a problem that has, at least from, for our community, a surprisingly long history. It's been studied for more than 100 years by now. One of the earliest researchers in this field, or one of the pioneers, is this guy, Erwin Krupa, and he had theorem in 1930 where he showed that if you see in two cameras five corresponding points that is sufficient to reconstruct the 3D location of the points and the motion of the camera. And you can imagine this was quite a breakthrough result and in fact this result paved the way for a lot of the computer vision 3D reconstruction technology that we see today. And in fact, all of this builds up on Krupa's result. Namely, they all start by saying, assume we have two cam images, like Krupa did. And then they say, assume we have corresponding points. So they extract points from the images and compute correspondence. 
but I mentioned that earlier, correspondence is nasty to call. You can manually, he was looking at photographs, and you could manually identify this point here, is this point there, like photographs taken from airplanes, if you will. But for, you know, automatic systems, you need a machine to compute correspondence, and then you don't know which point corresponds to which point. But this is how the pipelines tend to proceed, and then they compute something that's called bundle adjustment, something that computes camera motion and 3D location of these points. And so you see, somehow, Krupa's work has been very pioneering for the computer vision reconstruction pipelines that we have today. But I think it's always worth questioning even the heroes. And I would say Krupa was definitely very pioneering, but I think he was also very misleading. Why? When I see a camera today, I don't see points. I see colors. And it's not clear how to get from colors to points. And once I have points, I still don't have correspondence. How to compute which point in one image corresponds to which point in another is a super nasty problem. And lastly, I, when I switch on a video camera, I don't see two images, I see 30 images a second and stream along. Why should I select just two and forget the others is not clear. So somehow the assumptions Krupa's made, uh, Krupa made are not valid for a setting where I reconstruct with a moving camera, where I have lots of images full of lots of colors. And throwing out all these colors and just working with a few points more seems a little bit suboptimal and I'll show you it is. And so what we've designed over the last years are pipelines for 3D reconstruction algorithms which skip that whole intermediate step where I say let's not extract points and compute correspondence but let's try to work directly on the color in input stream. So here is a little bit of literature to show you some of the first real-time capable visual SLAM systems emerged in Stefano Suato's lab at UCLA. I was a postdoc then in the lab uh, and they had the first, I think around 2000, they showed that you can track a camera in real time and map the 3D world. But a lot of these techniques that emerged over the years, this is just a few selected works, pioneering works, a lot of these are key point based. They extract these key points or feature points. Here you see examples of these. And are, in that sense, what I would consider suboptimal. Because they don't work on data. They work on some pre-processed data, on points extracted and put into correspondence. And if there's anything that I learned from sensor and data analysis, it is that the closer you work on the raw data, the better your solutions are likely to be the more optimal, because in every abstraction step you are bound to make errors and these errors will deteriorate the subsequent performance. So this is the classical, what we call techniques, Krupa's, uh, the work that Krupa pioneered. Here is in comparison the direct methods. The key difference is in this flower pot example. What we minimize here is this photometric error. It's the error that I started with in the case of Beethoven as well, this color consistency as a cost criterion. And that drives everything. So we don't put points into correspondence and then minimize what's called a, a geometric reprojection error, but we minimize a color consistency on the input data. The overall approach is an approach we called LSD SLAM, for stands for Large Scale Direct SLAM. By the way, names are important, I noticed, to sell research. As researchers nowadays, we not only are supposed to develop great research, but then we have to actually go and sell it. Sometimes it feels a little bit like a, you know, a salesman for a vacuum cleaner. You have to go around and sell your method. And one thing I learned over the years is you have to give things a catchy name. And so my student came up with this large-scale, direct, monocular SLAM, and I thought, no one can remember that name. And so I said, why don't we call it LSD SLAM? And then he said, Daniel, that's the name of a drug. And I said, well, maybe that's a good thing. That way people will remember it. And I think it's worked out fairly well. The method has had quite some impact. But I would say it's not only the name that made the impact, but it's mainly part of it. 
in the end, it's probably mostly Jacob's talent that really made the difference. Here is, you know, it's a method, it's a little bit involved. There is one component that tracks the camera, one component that reconstructs depths from the images, and then one component that does this large optimization. A little bit the tracking component is what I already said. Here is this cost, the color consistency, but note now we estimate the rigid body three for translation in 3D, three for rotation, and we say find a camera motion such that the colors match. That's the cost. So you have an input image, you have a uh, related image, a keyframe, and you want to warp the current frame to the keyframe so that the, the colors are consistent. And you can do that. We checked since six parameters, really done in a course to find implementation in real time on a single thread of a laptop CPU. So this is not very cool. And so here you see uh, the LSD slam running. It runs on a single monocular camera here. Jacob is holding the camera. It runs on a laptop CPU and it maps the 3D world. In the top left you see the input images. The big screen shows the reconstructions. And what you see is, that's what we mean by large-scale reconstructions. It means we can not only recover the geometry of a table or a chair, but we can map entire outdoor areas. And you'll see larger reconstructions in a second. And I should say the really groundbreaking thing was the first real-time capable large-scale reconstructions that the community has seen. They're not dense like in the flower pot, so there is no geometric fill-in that we do here. Uh, Jacob did not believe in geometric fill-in. He said, I don't want a minimal surface fill-in. The world is not a minimal surface, which is probably true. <coughs> so there are structures missing. He calls it semi-dense, so for about half of the pixels we have a geometric estimate. This was the first version in these visual slam, direct visual slam methods, we call it. and then we worked on a follow-up method. You saw in the LSD slam chart there was one component tracking the camera, one component estimating geometry, and what is known is somehow this is a chicken and egg problem to understand where is the camera and where is the 3D world. If you know the camera you can estimate 3D like we did in the bunny example, and vice versa, but somehow estimating both is a, is a nasty coupled problem. And if you have an algorithm where you have a separate component doing each, that's not optimal somehow. So we aimed at doing something that is more direct and more jointly estimates both. And this is a technique that we call direct sparse odometry. And this is what you see in this video. Here again on the top left is the input imagery. You see a single color camera. And here you see the reconstructions computed from that single camera. And you see there are people moving through the scene. The algorithm actually is a static world, but it's extremely robust to things moving around in the camera image. And you see it can map a very large environment at a very high level of precision. We're tracking the camera. We're estimating the motion of the camera from frame to frame. And there are thousands of frames. And every time we estimate the motion relative to the previous frame, we're going to make an error, no doubt. And these errors are going to accumulate, and this is what's called a drift that is created. And you see the drift here. That bicycle here is reconstructed twice. Right? It's the same bicycle. So you see the drift, but how large is that drift? It's about maybe two, three meters, right? On a distance of hundreds of meters which means the precision of just tracking one single camera is in the range of less than 1% translational error. If you want to measure it in that way. We have a lot of sequences that we recorded, lots of different ones outdoor. Here's an indoor sequence in the main building. And what's characteristic for some of these sequences is there's a lot of reflections, lots of bad visibility, drastic lighting changes, etc. But still, we can reliably track that camera over several flights of chair, stairs and uh, track it back to where we started from. Again, there is a drift, maybe 10 centimeters, right? But again, on a distance of, say, 100 meters of walking. So that gives you an estimate of how accurate the method is. 
Still, you want to know in our field, really quantify the performance, not on one sequence or not on another sequence, but in the general world. And this is a big challenge in vision that we face on a daily basis. We want to develop methods that really work in the real world. But the question is, how can we quantify the performance in the real world? If you are in a room like here, you can build a motion capture system and track your camera with it. Then you know for every time where is the camera. Then you have ground truth. But then you can only demonstrate that performance in this room. And it's not a big room. So you want to map lots of environments, indoor, outdoor, and still have ground truth quantitative performance measures. How can you do that? Well, it's not easy, but what Jacob can following. He said he's going to record lots of sequences like the ones you saw. In fact, these are some of the sequences he recorded. Hundreds of minutes of video for in very diverse environments with very different lenses, some more sort of omnidirectional lenses, some more perspective camera. They're very diverse, but they, all these sequences have in common. They always loop back to where we started from. And then we know, we don't know where the camera was in between during the sequence, but we can determine where it should be at the very end. And so for each sequence we will have one number that tells us where is the camera at the end. <laughs> and the idea is if you have enough sequence, statistically reliable estimate of the performance of your drift overall drift per sequence and so what you see here are three error measures the translational error error the rotational error of the estimates of the camera rotation in degrees and the so-called scale drift uh, that we accumulate and what we compare to is the state of the art method in key point based slam so these are slam systems building up on krupa's assumptions on this key point extraction and this was the state of the art in this domain, a method called Orb Slam by the colleagues in Zaragoza. That is the accurate method to date among real time capable slam systems. And what I show you here is that our method is substantially more accurate. So, to how to read these plots. Basically, what we have here is the overall alignment error that we accumulated in every sequence, and here the number of sequences with that error. And so you can say, for example, if I want to track the best 300 sequences, what is the maximum error I had on these best 300 sequences? In our case, it's one. In Orb Slam, it's about six, which means the improvement in precision is by a factor of six, if you will. Or I want to have a maximum error of two. How many sequences can I track with that error? With Orb Slam, you can track about 100 sequences. With ours, about 400 sequences, which means the robustness, if you will, increases by a factor of four. The issue being, for every method, you can find some sequence where it works super well. But you really want systematically good performance on as many sequences as possible. And this is why we do this more extensive evaluation. And it shows drastic improvements of almost an order of magnitude. So when I said we assume that with a direct method we should be more accurate and more robust, here is the experimental proof for this. The experimental verification that indeed by working directly on the sensor data we drastically gain in precision. And this is not uncommon in, in research that there is an established paradigm that's been refined for decades. And then you look at it and you say, no, this is not how things should be done. And very often, you know, you have an idea that the way it should be done should be better. Unfortunately, it sometimes takes a number of years to really get there. And I was very, eventually Jacob actually managed to demonstrate that yes, methods are substantially more accurate and robust. What can you do with these? <clears throat> I mentioned things already in the beginning. You can do autonomous drones, autonomous cars. Here's examples of drone research. This is a drone, it's called Parrot by a company, uh, no, it's called Bebop by a company Parrot in France. It's a 
toy, you can buy it for a few hundred euro. If you don't have a Christmas present for your kids, you know, maybe. Um, what we do is we take this drone and we run it autonomously, so it's steered basically by a computer, and it uses predominantly the onboard camera to localize itself. And you can see here, it is programmed to fly a 360 degree turn and map the whole room uh, during the flight. So what you see are rooms that are reconstructed on the flight in real time. And then we moved on and showed that you can do obstacle avoidance, path planning, trajectory optimization, all based on our visual SLAM components. This, I should say, is worked by Luke, recently started his PhD thesis. No, he's starting in December, actually, in January. This is a real-time reconstruction from a driving car. So this is once you, we put, there's a second camera. This is data from the so-called Kitty data set recorded in Karlsruhe. And take the whole input data, two video streams from left and right camera. And as you can see, we can map the world in front of the camera at a very large scale and good resolution in real time. And the precision is sufficiently accurate that once you come back to where you started from, things actually line up. So, and the drift is so small that you hardly see the mismatch. And here we zoom in to show you the precision. You can really see the 3D structures. You can see the cars, the everything. So this is uh, the stereo version of LSD SLAM that you see here. Here you see, for example, the cars. And now, quite honestly, as you may have followed in the media, there's a lot of talk about self-driving cars that will come into the market one day. I can tell you from my perspective, we've worked with many car companies over the years. There is no consensus of what are the core components of the self-driving car not even what are the core sensors of the self-driving car. Traditionally, people think the LiDAR or laser will be the sensor to capture the 3D world. I believe, first of all, the main sensor of the self-driving car will be the camera. I'm very sure of that. We as humans mostly use our eyes to drive, and so will cars. They will have other sensors, but the sensor will be the and the other thing is, I'm quite certain that the self-driving car of the future will have a component like this one, which can use camera data to map the 3D world and localize itself in real time. At a level of precision where you can actually do obstacle avoidance and path planning and things like that. This is the uh, corresponding extension of DSO to stereo cameras, so this is stereo DSO. We found it substantially more accurate even than the stereo LSD SLAM. Here are some results where we drive around. We can map the world in real time again. We can actually compute over longer loops what is the overall drift that we accumulated, and you can actually check for yourself the drift is essentially zero. It's almost drift. And so you can use these techniques to create very large-scale maps of the 3D world used for self-driving cars or other purposes. And if you imagine every car driving around here had such a component in it, a stereo system with this algorithm, you can almost instantly map all of Germany. And then the idea is that you create 3D map data, maybe even fuse it in a cloud in a way that other cars can use your 3D data to navigate around. So there's more videos. If you're interested, there's lots and lots of such videos on the net that show our SLAM algorithms running on cars. To summarize, <coughs> I talked about a number of things. I talked about image-based 3D reconstruction. I first started by saying it's a difficult problem. It's difficult to find the optimal solutions efficiently, how you can use convex optimization to do this. Extensions of these techniques to reconstructing actions over time. 
at a very high level of precision. I talked about dense reconstruction from moving cameras in real time. So in contrast to these works, this is actually computed at 30 or 40 frames a second. Uh, I talked about the problem of SLAM, simultaneous localization and mapping. And uh, I presented in particular two works that we did in this uh, area. One is LSD SLAM, direct SLAM, and the follow-up is odometry. I should say both of these are online. If you are interested in this work, we put the source code online so you can do all of this and run it at home if you like. And in the end, I talked about extensions of these techniques of LSD SLAM and of cameras where you can get even larger, even more accurate and more robust reconstructions that you can use either for self-driving cars or for self-flying drones or whatever you like. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>